It's great that you came here to see about what I have to say, and I hope it's, it's interesting. Let's see. Uh, what is this about? Uh, there were several talks about BPF, so you know what BPF is. Uh, it's important to stress that BPF is not just about tracing or debugging. Uh, BPF is being used for high performance networking and all sorts of other interesting things where you add functionality to the, to the kernel in a safe way and that is being experimented a lot and you should expect lots of other things to be implemented as BPF in the near future. In this presentation, we're gonna be talking about things that will help have this new functionality implemented and in place. And I hope that by listening and hearing about it, you can get ideas of how to do even more stuff uh, with this infrastructure that's being put in place. So BTF, it's, uh, it started as a way for you to, to have a more compact um, type information. Uh, information about data structures so that you could somehow use this to more easily uh, create the BPF programs so that the kernel can use this information to validate what the BPF programs are doing and uh, lots of other interesting things. Uh, it started with data, data types, but then nowadays we have file number of the file information, the file name for that specific program and line number information so that you can do things like annotation uh, when doing profiling. I will show some examples of that. And also there are representation for global variables that as well I will be showing as how it's being used um, in some feature. It is it's spreading, the, the BTF usage is spreading. Uh, you, uh, it's being used in most, if not all, of the uh, bleeding edge uh, BPF features that are being implemented. I will describe uh, CoRE, which is uh, in how BPF, uh, BTF is used in there, uh, which is uh, compiled once run everywhere, which in the past was the motto for Java, but this time seems to be uh, done right. I will talk about a little bit about BPF trample lines that will uh, enable some of the features that I'll be describing, struct opts, which is a way for you to, for functionality in the kernel that is implemented as a table of functional operations to be implemented as a BPF, as a series of BPF programs. Uh, a little bit about dynamic relinking, and uh, KRSI, I will not be describing, but it uses the, 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 the features that are being described before. So the, 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 the first thing to note about BTF is that it's becoming always present. Uh, when, when you wanted to do some analysis uh, 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 using uh, the pre-existing uh, debugging information, uh, dwarf, you would have to install a separate package which was really big and this gets in the way. So sometimes you, even having that information which is quite complete and allows you to do a lot of stuff, you ended up not using it because sometimes there is uh, size constraints on the system that you are uh, uh, wanting to do some, some analysis. Uh, but with BTF is different, it's uh, compact. It goes from a hundreds of megabytes and dwarf to a few megabytes. In the Linux kernel now, the, the, uh, it's, if you want to use those BPF features, and uh, it, it will be made available in CSFS in this file. So it will be always there. You, you don't need to install anything else. So the types are gonna be always there. Uh, it's uh, right now on 550RC6, it's uh, three megabytes about, or a little bit less than that. And uh, the, talking about the pr producers and consumers of BTF, the first one 
was PAHO, which is a tool that the kernel community uses to uh, find uh, alignment, uh, uh, spaces uh, that are left for, uh, because of alignment in data structures, so that you could, when adding new fields, use the, the, that, that space, and to see how uh, the data structure is laid out in memory, where in, in which cache line. I'm gonna show some examples. It loads dwarf, which is what the GCC and, uh, generates as debugging information for a Linux kernel, and uh, encodes BTF. So there is an internal representation that uh, we first convert dwarfs to this representation, and then you generate BTF. In the past, the CTF, which was used for uh, D-Trace, uh, I, I did support, uh, added support for that a long time ago, and then nowadays uh, that, that code was retrofitted to generate uh, BTF. So since it generates from the wharf, and we want to be, to be sure that the information, that what this conversion happened without introducing problems, there are some tools like BTF diff, uh, together with PAHO, where you, you will run it uh, to produce output using as input the BTF information, and as well using the input as the dwarf information. Then you compare the results, and it should be the same. Uh, another regression test for that is called full circle, which basically gets the debugging information, regenerates the source code, rebuilds the source code with debug info, and then gets this new debug info to compare with the, fir the, the first one. So it, it does the full circle. Regression test again. So p plus a kernel. Now you have this option, config debug info BTF uh, enabled. And so as a part of the kernel building process, as the last step, Peerhole is used to get the dwarf information convert into BTF, and then it uses a deduplication algorithm to get, because dwarf is, is implemented in such a way that every object file that composes the kernel, and there are thousands of them, has the complete uh, type information for the types used in that specific object. And that's why it, it, the resulting VM Linux dwarf information is so big. So what uh, PAHO, together with libbpf, where the, the, the duplication algorithm is there, does is to reduce the duplicates, and then that's why it gets so small. Uh, PAHO plus BTF. So besides uh, encoding BTF, you can decode BTF, and that, that's uh, which hopefully will make it more used, because since now we have it all the time in syscarn BTF VM Linux, you can use it as, your, as a kernel developer, a day-to-day -day, uh, workflow. So there are lots of things that were present there already that continues to work with BTF. Like you can ask for the size. If you just do PA hole dash dash size, it will try the kernel debugging information uh, present in the BTF that is, is in CZFS. So it, what this screen is, is showing is basically you are asking for the size of all the data structures in the kernel, and then you sort it, and then you see which ones are the biggest ones. And the second column says uh, how many alignment holes are, are there. So you could uh, do this to try to optimize the kernel. There is another thing that you can do with this BTF information and with Dwarf as well, which is to ask which of the data structures in the kernel contains some other data structure. So if you ask for what are the data structures in the kernel that, that uh, contains a list head, it will tell you. Uh, for instance, uh, task struct has many of those, and then you can you ask for the dash dash x to have the offsets in, in x. There are lots of, the, another thing you can do is ask for what are the data structures in the kernel that, ha that have pointers to another data structure. Uh, so let's say who, who, which data structures in the kernel have pointers to the struct BPF prog, all of these with this uh, member names. Uh, so if you look at SK filter, there is a pointer to, to uh, and here is 
th there is one aligned at whole, whole uh, that ref count is four, four bytes, and then this new one has to be aligned at eight. So if you want to add some new field here and it's less than or equal to four bytes, you can put it here. And the other one, uh, XDP attachment info. And you can now, and since it defaults to using the kernel one, you can just use the name of the type and it will show you. It, this is really, really fast, let's say. If you do, it's instantaneous. If you do, let's say, it will, raw spin lock is a type dev, and then it, this is a uh, raw spin lock, oh, there's something else inside, so you can ask it to expand the pointers, and it will show that raw spin lock is an arc spin lock, that is a Q spin lock, that is a union, that has a, a atomic T, which is a, a counter, and so on and so forth, can expand everything. And you can use these offsets here to see the offset from the start of the struct. It can help you with OPS decoding and other things where you have multiple substructs. So let's get back to it. BPF2. BPF2 is a canonical tool for you to uh, introspect the system or do lots of operations related to BPF. The kernel provides several uh, interfaces via the sys BPF syscall, and uh, one of them is this BPF get FD by ID. So you, you, you have a BPF program, and then you ask for, for the BTF information associated with that program, and then you can do things with it, like doing pre-printing pre uh, map key values, or intermixing source code with bytecode or jitted code, things like that. For instance, BPF2, that there is this new subcommand, BPF2 BTF, which is recent. And then you can see that there are lots of things that you can do. You can ask for the source file. It will try to regenerate, get the, the, the source file for some specific program. You can uh, do things like, for instance, uh, there is some use of BPF in perf trace. It puts in place several uh, programs. BPF2 prog, prog will list those programs. And then you can have the tag, and you can have IDs here. And if you do BPF2 BTF dump map ID 168, uh, which is the map that I, I wanted to see, it will tell me that the key is an integer, four bytes, and uh, it's signed. And if I ask for the, for the value, what, what are the values in this map? It will show you that the values in this map is a strict syscall, and then it will expand the types needed for you to create a program that, you, that sets up the, those values, because you ask it for format C. Uh, and you can as well ask for dumping a file in the C format for that, that BTF uh, VM Linux. So I, I was asking for a strict FPU, and then you're gonna see that it puts these funny things here, uh, types with uh, fields without a name, because it has a need for that. BTF doesn't have information about alignment, a specific alignment, uh, explicit alignment. Uh, so if you look at, at PA hole dumping the kernel BTF for that same structure, you're gonna see that there's 48 bytes here between this and the other one. If I ask for the same thing using Dwarf, Dwarf has information about the attribute alignment. So you know why this 48 bytes hole is here, because the developer asked that the state for the uh, floating points, registers, be aligned at, at 64 bytes. So the kernel was, like peer hole encoded BTF, the first consumer, the first piece of software that was Reading that information was the kernel. So the kernel, uh, you, you, you say BPF, BTF load. You, you load a program, then you associate the BTF with it. So that later on, you can ask for this information on a profiler or on BPF2 or somewhere else. Uh, it validates BTF and it validates 
the header, if it's a bit BTF magic, BTF version, the flags. And if you look at the BTF verifier, there are lots of things that it tries to verify. Um, just like it verifies programs, BPF programs verifies the, the type information associated with it. If you use perf trace and see and run perf trace, asking for the slip, uh, nano slip, uh, syscall, it will and, and perf trace is using a BPF program and it's loading the BTF information associated with this this program. So using perf trace for the BTF. Uh, functions in the kernel that has BTF in its, in its name, we can see that it's doing the, 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 the getting to the BTF verifier, verifying log members, verifying ser several information. Uh, since kernel BTF, uh, BTF VM Linux is raw BTF, it's always available. That's, that's I described it before. So it's compact, and here you can see the comparison with the uh, uh, dwarf, the equivalent dwarf information, so it's way less uh, space that's uh, used. BTF uses this for this specific kernel, and the dwarf uses uh, this, the sum of, of those uh, ELF sections. BPF compile once run everywhere. This is the first, the first serious user of all these things, of BTF, and uh, so the, the problem is that you have uh, let's say an, an organization where you have lots of machines and several of those machines are in departments or wherever, so you don't have the same kernel running on all of them. So you want to deploy some BPF programs, some set of BPF programs on all of those kernels. And uh, you don't know if the data structures in the, that are used on those uh, BPF programs change it. So this feature, uh, uh, saves information in the BPF program and has the type information for the kernel and can compare. I can compare if the things that are being used in the BPF program are in offsets different than the ones that this specific kernel is running. It goes uh, way more than that and I will describe the, uh, all the things that is done so that one program can run on different kernels even kernels where some features are not present or so that it can fail gracefully. Telling, oh no, in this kernel, I need this specific field in this specific structure and it's not present or it changes types. Uh, so th there's a feature that comes in some, in uh, uh, Clung, which is built in preserve access index that initially you had to in every access to data structures that you think that could change uh, from kernel to kernel, you had to use this, this thing. Of course, you would do a define a macro to, to have a shorter form, but it was cumbersome. Uh, when it's loading the program, it looks at, at those relocation records, and then if everything, if the data structure is the same, that's okay, you load it and run. If it's not, you go on all of those places and you fix it up before you, you load the program. So uh, uh, KABI, for instance, uh, for BPF programs is not uh, an issue. Uh, this is, uh, actually, this is KABI. It's fixed on the fly. Uh, it records even bit, bit field accesses. So another thing that is present, it's uh, external variables. So if you, on a BPF program, you say, oh, I, I have this, I, I, can't, I, I want to use this external variable. And the external variable, it's named Linux kernel version. It, the, the Clang will build the, the BPF bytecode in a way that records, oh, this has to be resolved at link time. And who does the linking? The linking is done by libbpf. And libbpf looks at the external ones, unresolved ones, and if it's Linux kernel version, it goes there and does constant propagation. It just replaces at the site it is using with the value for this variable, this external variable. And, and that's the same for all the k-config entries. So if you want to have a program like a congestion control algorithm implemented in BPF and you need to know uh, uh, the value of config hertz, let's say, you just declare 
it as a, a external variable, and at load time, that specific kernel will have the right value inserted where it's used as a constant, not, not as a variable that will incur in access and go into the cache. It uses, config, it uses this boot config you name or fallback to proc config, or in your program you can uh, use some specific thing to override this because perhaps in your system this is not available. Uh, if you look at all those things are in self-tests, and those self-tests are like the canonical example of using the, those features. So VM Linux, that, that's another thing that you can do with BPF2. You do BPF2 BTF dump, and you see this file, which is raw BTF, and you, and you ask for format C, and it will generate all the types for the kernel in such a order that it's compilable. And this, this thing at the beginning, it's an improvement for that uh, relocation record request that we saw. Uh, you d use this pragma clung, uh, uh, push an attribute, say, preserve access in index for all the types that are from here to when I do a pragma clang attribute pop. So all the types in the kernel, if used in this program, that is including this VM Linux uh, .h, uh, if they change, no problem, you, uh, the, the libbpf will do the, the relocations and uh, your program will continue working even if you change some ker core kernel data structure. So let's see, the, the first, first struct in these is unsurprisingly uh, Atomic 64T or list head, so everything is compilable. Okay. So, with this in mind, let, let's let's take a look at something that was implemented something like two or three weeks ago, which is called uh, Run Queue Slower, which is initially was a BCC program, the the the, the, the BCC uh, the BPF compiler collection or how it's called. It basically it basically tra traces high scheduling delays. So BT, BTF, BPF2 uh, allows you to create a BPF program, build it, and then from the object file, generate an skeleton that provides all you need to process the events produced by this BPF program. Uh, it's auto-generated from the object file. Uh, that relock, relocatable VM Linux is this thing this thing that I, I mentioned, this, this thing here. Uh, because it's necessary for BTF type at raw trace points. So th that's something, uh, 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 another thing which is really powerful. Well, when you are using, let's say, uh, BPF trace, you don't see those things, but, but those things are implemented in terms of, of this kind of technology that I'm describing now. And we're gonna see what is this BTF typed uh, in the example. So, but, but then I was trying to build this thing and uh, it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't build. Uh, my, I was thinking that was a problem, I was talking. But then, update your system. I have been uh, dealing with BPF, with BPF in the perf context. Perf has some support for BPF. And so I had, uh, I had uh, have been building uh, LLVM and Clang for a long time, but, the, but I was building it from the Git mirror from the SVN thing where they maintain it. They had separate things for Clang and for LLVM. Okay, no problem, just Git update, remote update, pull and build. But then when I was trying the, that, that thing here, I did the update and it didn't work. So I, I was talking with Young Hong Song at Facebook and Andrew Nakrio, because those are BTF thing on the libbpf and on the, on the LLVM side, and they say, no, you, sh you should use this other thing here. Now, at first he said, oh, uh, it's working for me. Um, it's working for me. So I, 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 I did some Googling around, and, then the, and I saw this GitHub move, and. Uh, Okay, they stopped updating the repositories I was using two weeks ago or three weeks ago. So I got it to 
I, I move it the repository and, 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 and uh, build it to get close to LLVM 11 uh, to get this pragma attribute preserve access in it and to get uh, some other information that are needed for other features. Um, so with all that's needed in place, what, and that's something interesting. This thing now, it's, it's living on tools BPF run queues, low, uh, run queues lower. So the idea is that this is a way for you to create tools uh, that will be auto-contained auto uh, and, and maintain it in the kernel source. So it's, it's like a, the, the kernel repository source for some specific tools. This is the initial one. So it basically will, will, will link the BPF, will link BPF tool, it will install BPF tool. It does all, all the things for you. Uh, it makes sure that the latest BPF is there, BPF tool is there, generates uh, VM Linux.h, uh, compiles the runs kilo or bpf.o, which is the kernel part, which is the BPF program, and generates the scale from, from this one and compile the thing. And, that, and let's, let's what, uh, what was that it generated? Generated a binary, uh, which is um, a half a megabyte, and uh, that was something that Andrew. And if you strip it, you throw away the debugging information, which is dwarf, it's not useful at all, and, and even more in this context, you have this tool that you run like this. It's, it's a binary, auto-contained with everything, with the kernel part, the user space part, and uh, you don't need to have any tool chain on your machine, you can run it on any kernel version, and it's accessing, and so, so I was running it, passing parameters in the command line. So boilerplate is being reduced to create th this thing. Uh, everything is a single binary, it's small, runs in any kernel. L let's unroll the magic. It's similar to BCC, it has a user space part and a BPF kernel part. It does nat natural struct uh, a few dereference, so you don't have to use BPF probe read or whatever. Those are the dance. Um, and then you, you come to, uh, let's see how is the common user space BPF header. So th this uh, include file basically defines what is being communicated from the kernel to the user space part, which is what, what is the event, what is being collected in the kernel in the circumstance that we'll see, and is passed to user space for consumption. So the user space part. Uh, is this, you have to write it, and then it uses argp, I mean, it's, it's a user space program. Uh, it will initialize global data with the options that you collect from the command line. Um, the, the skeleton noticed that there were external variables, uh, that there were global variables. So it makes it so that the program can uh, alter the value of those variables before loading the program to the kernel. Uh, sets up the perforating buffers, that, that's the way for you to communicate from the kernel space to user space. Reads the event, everything using uh, libpf. So the event handler, I mean, at the beginning, you have this thing, which is the auto-generated, and, and the other one that I showed. And the, to handle the event, you have some standard parameters, and then you cast this data to that strict event, uh, you get the time and you print it, the, the task, P, and, and the delta. Uh, the main loop is basically you, you parse the things, you open the BPF. This was generated, auto-generated by that BPF scale, BPF2 scale. And here you set the minimum, the, the, the command line argument. It, it, the skeleton generator uh, said, generated it so that there is this uh, so this field, and then there is one struct with that name that is in the BPF program, as we'll see uh, later. And then it loads the BPF, attaches it, uh, prints some column, and then sets up the handle event. You can handle loss events as well. If, if it's a high frequency event, you, can, you may lose, and then you want to be notified. You create the perf, buff, uh, perf, perf buffer, uh, with the uh, callbacks, 
and then that's it. You, you run it in a loop, printing the thing. So that, that, that's the, the user space part. The kernel BPF part is this uh, run key slower BPFC, um, uses perpid uh, hash map for timestamps. Uh, it sets up things, it connects to BTF trace points. I will explain what this is uh, when it's, we see them. Uh, to, uh, to use normal point of the reference, sets up the events and push through the space via the, the, via the, 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 via the, the perforating buffer. So it starts like this. We include that VM Linux that was generated from the BTF information for the kernel. Include some helpers, include that common part, which has the uh, strict event definition. And then here, you declare some global variables that uh, you, you that, that's another one. I, I suppress it so that the, the program was smaller to show, but the, you could set the target PID as well. I, I'm only interested in, in, in uh, scheduling latencies for a specific target PID. Uh, and then here is how in C you define a, a map. You, you, you see that's type hash, that uh, 10,240, uh, the, the type for the key, is U32, the value U64, and you declare it as start. And then here, it's another one, it's just the perforating buffer. This is still some boilerplate. It should be more compact. And then, if you look at the, uh, the BPF that was generated, you're gonna see that, that those two uh, symbols, which are global, and that's what the, the BPF2 skeleton generator sees and allows the, the, the tooling user space to set in the process of loading via uh, libpf. The kernel program starts with the, a simple function uh, that uses um, some uh, BPF helpers, like uh, BPF time get and s, and BPF map update lm to, to it, it, it reads the timestamp and uh, it stores this in the start map uh, with PID as the key and the timestamp as the value. Then it, it starts the, the interesting thing, which is the, uh, the BTF trace point. So you, you know that for a trace point, uh, the, for this trace point, uh, SCAD, SCAD, wake up, you, the, the parameter is just task struct. So you can just come here, cast it, and access it directly. Uh, the verifier will make sure that this is uh, safe. And then you have the SCAD switch, which where you have a different uh, prototype, and you have two, uh, the, the, the task that was running in the next one, and then you get information from the next one, and then you do the lookup for this thing, and you get uh, another timestamp and subtract from the, the one that you got from the, the map, and, and uh, check that it's, uh, uh, it's more than the, the specified minimum latency that you want. You, if, if everything is it's, it's all right, I want to pass this to user space, so I, I create the, the event, the PID, the delta, and use another helper for BPF to get the task, the, the current task come. And I, and I push this to user space. And then I delete that thing from the map so that the next delay can find it and not there. And then it, it, the object details, it's, it's this, the, the BPF, uh, the B, the BPF bytecode is 31 kilobytes, and it, this includes the, the BTF information, the debug information for all the types that it's using, like task struct is there. Uh, it's a it's, uh, BPF bytecode, and uh, you have the relocation information for the fields that we're using. This, I'll just briefly talk because the, the time is running out. Uh, this is another new feature uh, which will allow uh, parts of the kernel that are implemented as, let's say, plugins, let, uh, where you have multiple implementations for some specific piece of functionality to be implemented as modules. Uh, in, in the past, they, they were implemented as modules, but w now we have this uh, compile once run uh, everywhere, infrastructure, and it should be a general mechanism for any kernel strict ops. And this opens the door for lots of uh, parts of the kernel to be re-implemented as BPF programs. Uh, 
So I think that people choose the TCP congestion algorithms because it's difficult to get one that's, that satisfies everybody. So in the kernel right now, we have all of those congestion control algorithms. That, that's quite a lot. Uh, so the first example that they did was data center TCP, which is one of those congestion control algorithms. You have the self-test for it. You can take a look at it. Uh, it's not the same. It's just the initial thing to test uh, how this infrastructure will work. So it has helpers for TCP SOC, in net connection SOC, structs large. I, I will show a little bit. You, you keep the structs with the same name as in the kernel. So, but with just the fields needed for uh, DC, uh, TCP. That, that's something interesting. I mean, the, the feature initially was for you to, to realize, oh, uh, this field I want is at a different offset. That's okay. Uh, if you, I remove hundreds of fields from uh, task struct, but the ones I need are still there, okay. That's what this thing is doing. So for passing arguments, it's the same thing I, I described before. But and these, if you, if you look at the TCP helpers.h for this specific uh, congestion control thing, it has TCP SOC with those fields, yes? Uh, it, it even fits in, into a, just one screen. But if you look at TCP SOC in the kernel, it has uh, 135 members. It's way more than that. It's, it's, that that's not, what, what you are seeing here is not the full TCP SOC. It's the subset of TCP SOC that's used by the congestion control algorithm. And this is allowed by the compiler once run everywhere. Uh, of course, when you declare something like this in your BPF program, the offset for this thing will be different from the offset of this thing in the kernel. So it has to have some sort of relocation while it, this is being loaded into the kernel. Uh, so you have a map, a new BPF map, where you, that you use to uh, register and register and introspect this strict op. So libbpf will receive a pointer to this congestion ops and you populate the map through a series of operations. There are uh, several details that are, uh, I don't have time to, to look here. And you can do a BPF map dump, and we'll see how many users, how many sockets are using this specific congestion control algorithm implemented in BPF. And that's how you do internally. Uh, that's a, a, a new type of BPF program, strict opt. And then you, you declare some variable, some, some function here. This will put this into some specific, it's a special uh, ELF section that, that libbpf will find and, and do its magic. And, and here, inside, you, it, it's, it's kind of, it's just like you implemented TCP congestion control algorithm in the kernel, as a kernel module. It, it's no different than, than it. So this is BPF program. And, and the way it looks natural, it's because of all those things that I described so far, that allows uh, the, the, the BPF verifier to know that this program has, that, that the program that this thing will connect to in that struct ops, uh, table, receives just one struct SOC. This is, the, this is the type, and it has access to the type, and it, and it can validate all of those accesses. So the, the, the BPF program now looks like just kernel code, but it's not kernel code, it's a, it's a byte code that the kernel will verify something that was not done before with kernel modules. So kernel modules are extremely unsafe compared to this. And then that's, a, that's another, uh, another uh, method that's implemented. Uh, there is BPF trample lines. My presentation is, is uh, available online. But that's the time I had to present. I think that stopping here, I shouldn't have provided uh, enough useful information. Do you have any questions? Yeah, but BTF for kernel models should be at that directory when it's done, but it's not yet. So there will be different 
let me go back. That, that will be on that uh, slash C's uh, uh, BTF uh, directory. You're going to have one per, I, 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 like, like the lib modules hierarchy, one, one file per module. And then when you are handling, uh, dealing with modules, uh, libbpf will know where to, to get those, that, that information. I don't know, probably BTF will refer back to the types that are defined in the main file so, that, so as to save space. Um, yeah. Thank you, Dan. The other question would be, uh, so do you think it's time we would basically write all these C tools into the core of our infrastructure? Uh, well, I mean, uh, uh, Alexei said that he would be here. Oh, he's there. I think that's been used uh, quite a, a lot already in, in several organizations, including one that he pays his salary. So uh, it, it's mature, but uh, it's in the point of you experimenting and trying to see how this fits into your organization, into your use cases. Can you elaborate? So, so you get a struct that has an array and two variables of the same type, and you initially try to access the first variable, and then you remove I mean, uh, the, uh, there, are, there, are, there are several things that you can do to, to check this. It's, it's just uh, there is the name of the field, and then there is the type of the field. So, I mean. So you key off the name as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the, there is a name, there's a field, there's a, the, there's a name, type, offset, size. So, so it could have the same type and offset, but the, the size of the type, let's say, if it's embedded one, change it. And so you could say, no, 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 the, the, this type that I'm accessing, change it in size, so I will bail out at program loading. No, this is, this is all upstream already. I mean. Yeah, there are some stuff that are here that are in BPF Next. There are some stuff that are here. For instance, the, the PA hole generating BTF information, I think it's already 5.4, yes? 5.5 will come with more stuff, and I mean, there are lots of things happening. Uh, we had, some, some of those things require new versions of the Clang and LLVM, as I discussed it. So it's, I mean, it's, it's uh, what, what I'm describing here, some of the things that I described here, uh, there, there, there are some more here at the end that I didn't have time to, to, that were done, let's say, yesterday or the day before, or like this. Well, uh, uh, here, let's see. BPF dynamic relinking. There was no time for, for talking about that, but it's something that will help a lot with some use cases where you have to replace existing code with uh, a different one or combining two, f two chains in a link of things that you want to run into one so that you can replace atomically. There are lots of new features in the, this area. It's really in flux. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the getting perf C to C and going to the data structure. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, I mean that, that that that's something that that remains to be done. Yes. So you can get a hit uh, a a cache miss at some point, and then uh, you have the information about the offset in the cache line, and then you have the the physical address. So you have to go back to, to a type, like going back from, to, through the series of moves and et cetera, all the way to the, a global variable or to a, uh, a parameter to this function. So it, it's something that somebody has to do. And perhaps these will require uh, some changes in compilers, uh, but 
for BitPF programs, this should be much easier now because we have the, uh, the relocation records. So that what's being accessed here? You go there and do the lookup back and then you, you know. But for the kernel as a whole, you have to use all the techniques because there are all sorts of optimizations that are in place. So I think that the best thing we could do is to go to the IP address, see the instructions, see what it's doing, and then try to go back, backtracking all the way to, to a global variable or to a, a parameter, and then try to navigate from that. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Later, yeah, exactly. Uh, all the way, all the way to the push. Yes. Right. Yeah. So but for for. for yeah, th there is a cost associated with that. I mean, you, 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 but but you have to have these. Uh, probably this is going to disable some optimization, or perhaps, or I don't know. I haven't looked in depth at this. I just know that this is required, that you have to know where the fields are being used, what are the types, so that you can go and do the relocation. I'm, I'm asking if something is reasonably stable. Like, I'm pretty sure it will not move within several years. Yeah. Is it remarkable or not? Yeah, up to you, uh, up to you. <laughs> up to you. If you are completely sure that the data structure that you are accessing the kernel is set in stone, like, like, like the, the ABI ones, like for, for Cisco arguments, you don't need BTF for that. It's set in stone for that specific architecture. If you access it you following the ABI, no need for relocation records. Any more questions? Uh, three minutes more. I think I'm going to write some more slides. Oh. Let me see. Okay, thank you.